15, uh, Cook versus Committee for Frank Martino. I believe we've got parties present on this one as well. Uh, I, I think the board by this time is, is generally familiar with the background on the matter. Um, the board's order of May 18, 2016, directed the committee to amend its past reporting as to its expenditures reporting to Happy Super Service and Spring Valley Bank, and further provided that the committee failed to amend in a timely manner. The matter would go to public hearing. Uh, out of the public hearing, the committee, uh, or the hearing officer was recommended uh, that the board proceed to assess appropriate fines against the committee for failing to amend its 2014 and 2015 reports, the records prior to 2014 having been destroyed as permitted under the election code two-year record retention plan. Uh, I'm concurring uh, with the uh, recommendation of the hearing officer. I, I note that normally uh, where we're proceeding to assess a fine, our I know, for failure to follow an order uh, we generally require that uh, an explicit reference to the possibility of a fine be mentioned. In this sort of an instance, uh, we already have the committee serving uh, the person who's holding the records that would be necessary in order to amend the report, asserting a Fifth Amendment uh, defense, if you will, against any sort of uh, testimony or, or um, production on that sort of thing. Uh, so I think we're at the point where I mean, I'm concurring with the hearing officer and the board to determine an appropriate uh, resolution at this point. Just before we let the party, okay. the, the hearing officer's recommendation explicitly states that the board should impose a fine. Yes, it does. Okay. All right, we'll hear from the complainant first. Who's here on behalf of Mr. Uh, I'm his attorney. This All right, boss. come on up and identify yourself to the court reporter. Yes. That's good right there. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Schwab, C-H-W-A-D. I'm an attorney for Dave Cook, who's a complaint in this matter. Um, we, uh, we disagree with the recommendation of the hearing examiner on a couple of issues. Obviously, we agree that uh, for the period for 2014 and 2015 that there was violation of the order and that fine should be imposed. We had asked the hearing officer to address the merits of the complainant's complaint at the, at the public hearing. And we addressed those issues with argument and evidence and testimony. Those issues being the spending at Happy Super Service Station and uh, the Spring Valley City Bank. And we provided evidence and testimony that showed that at Happy Super Service Station, the committee was paying for gas and repairs of personal vehicles, not campaign vehicles. And instead of reimbursing people who own personal vehicles for their travel expenses with uh, the IRS-based uh, uh, travel reimbursement, they were just paying for the gas. <coughs> That's in violation of the code. That wasn't addressed by the hearing examiner, but it was alleged in the complaint, so we'd like the board to address that issue. We did address that issue in argument at the public hearing in our brief, and the respondent responded to those arguments. So we think that that issue is right for the board to decide. With respect to the bank, we have testimony that what was happening was that the, the committee, either Patricia Manu, the treasurer, or Frank Martino, who is the, uh, the chair of the committee, um, will, would write a check to the bank, go to the bank, cash that check, and take the cash, and then use it for whatever purpose, campaign purpose, allegedly, that, uh, that they, would, they would do, but they wouldn't necessarily always get received. And then when they reported that, they did not report, they reported that the money was going to the bank, not that the money was going to whatever, uh, whatever vendor or whatever uh, person was receiving that payment. So 
We also alleged in the complaint that that was a violation of the code. We addressed that in the public hearing, and that was not addressed in the hearing officer's report. So we would like the board to address that issue as well. Um, with respect to the board's recommendations, with respect to the issue of whether the committee answered the question of whether they had personal vehicles, uh, or whether they, or whether, I'm sorry, whether they used personal vehicles or whether they had a vehicle that was owned or leased by the committee. The hearing examiner recommends that the committee was not liable for a willful violation because Patricia Manu testified uh, in a deposition that they had used personal vehicles. But that doesn't make any sense because that deposition was taken by us. And I asked those questions. So it makes no sense to say that the committee complied with the board's order by answering my questions in a complaint, pursuant to a complaint, in a deposition that we subpoenaed. That's like uh, the, the hearing examiner, uh, we filed a motion to reconsider that you may have before you. The hearing examiner uses the analogy of a divorce proceeding uh, when he evaluates this case. If we use that same analogy here, it would be like if a husband and a wife were in a divorce proceeding, and the husband was ordered to uh, produce his assets, show his assets, and he failed to do so, and the wife's attorney subpoenaed his uh, financial institutions, which <coughs> responded to the, that subpoena with his financial uh, records, that would be like saying that the husband complied with the court's order to turn over his financial uh, information. That, that's exactly what the situation is here. It doesn't make any sense to say that the board, or that the committee complied with uh, the order because we subpoenaed them. Just one, one second, Council. You, you indicated you filed a motion to reconsider. Was that motion made to the hearing officer? It was made to the hearing officer and he denied it. Okay. Uh, I believe it was also copied for the general counsel. Okay. When was the hearing, when was the motion ruled on? Uh, last week, maybe Wednesday, I think. Uh, my last point is with respect to the board's order for, uh, for the stuff before 2013, the hearing examiner recommends that they were not willfully uh, not complying with the order because the, uh, they followed the board's advice to destroy records that were more than two years old. With respect to the Happy's uh, documents. There are, uh, in the record, there are uh, records, invoices from 2013. So uh, it doesn't make any sense to say that they couldn't have complied because they didn't have the records when they produced records from 2013. Um, and also the fact that they were generally violating, both with respect to Happy's and the bank, that they were generally violating the law by reporting this and therefore not actually reporting the proper parties who received payment shouldn't give them an out for failure to comply. Basically saying that, well, what we did was illegal, so and so we couldn't have complied with the board's order. This shouldn't be a justification to say that they can't now comply with the board's order to amend this. So with those, uh, those points, uh, we think that the, the board should take the hearing officer's recommendation to the 2013-2014 issues, and then, uh, in addition, uh, also find the board for, or also find the committee for the um, the failure to comply with the board work entirely. And also, we'd like to substitute. <coughs> Questions for Mr. Schwab? Yes, Mr. Schwab. What about this issue? What's before the board today? Is it just the failure to comply with our order? Well, we have, I, I, I believe what Mr. Krasny was doing with the testimony at the hearing, we had already established that the Happy's uh, service station in the Spring Valley Bank reporting was sufficient all the way back from the closed hearing. And, and that led into our order of, of May, uh, 18th of last year uh, that the Happy Service Station uh, and the Spring Valley Bank reports sh should be amended 
had they been amended, we would have had to go to public hearing. Having not been amended, we did proceed to public hearing. I think Mr. Krasny was taking the deficiency as to the reporting on those two items as being sort of res judicata or already decided as a part of the matter, and he wasn't relitigating that at the public hearing. Although both parties did put evidence in with that, in that regard. Question number B, Mr. Menzel, what's before us, my understanding is whether or not they comply with the ordinance, correct? Yes. Or had a valid defense to not comply with it, correct? Yes. And the maximum we can do as far as a penalty is what Mr. Krasny recommended, a $5,000 fine, correct? $5,000 is the maximum fine for failure to comply with the board order. So what Mr. Krasny has recommended is the max, it would be? I think in the way we have it presented to us, that probably is the case. Thank you. Other questions? All right, if not, we'll hear from the respondent. Thank you, Mr. Schwab. Respondent, Council of Chicago. Yes, Mr. Chairman, this is Anthony Jacob on behalf of the respondent. Okay, go right ahead. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, board, for hearing this matter. We've now come to a conclusion. I think this was a long but fair process. This board appointed a hearing officer to hear the matter and on point dealt with the issue with respect to compliance with the board order. The hearing officer did find one of the three points to have been willfully violated by the committee. And I'd like to present an argument that that committee did not willfully violate the board order. During the hearing process and during discovery, the committee responded to complainants' document requests. They provided the information that was requested. The information was submitted, was made part of the record for the public hearing, and any information that would be needed to amend the reports had been provided. And so the committee did not willfully violate the board's order. There are reasons why the committee cannot amend and comply with the board's order. It does not have officers that can sign off on an attestation to amend the reports. The committee has been dissolved for over a year. There is no treasurer. There is no chairman. And in fact, the prior chairperson is restricted by law from having to take any action with respect to the committee. It would certainly make the complainant no happier than for us to take some action so that they can then take further action against us. And what I mean by that is, you know, we are in a position as a dissolved committee to not be able to take any further actions, but have cooperated through this entire process and have responded with documents that have been requested by the complainant. And so I tell you, in that regard, the committee has not willfully violated any board order. Questions for Mr. Jacob? So, go ahead, Mr. Jacobs. Yeah, I hate to be repetitious, but I have to ask Mr. Jacob a question. What is the status of the federal case? The status is that we have no information that we can provide at this time. Is it still an investigation? Has anybody been charged? No, no one has been charged. Okay. Again, I know there was a call made to the U.S. Attorney's Office or the FBI, I forget which, and they said, I don't worry about it. Well, I do worry about it. You know, we go to a court of law and there's an investigation pending by a higher authority, the federal government. You go to a state court, I don't think the judge is going to hear that case until the federal matter is resolved. And the same thing, I think that most of my experience has been the legislative process. I know a legislative committee can offer a bill if the contents of that bill are being litigated. Now, we shouldn't even have this thing here. I mean, I think there should be a hearing on the merits. There's official problems here. But I don't think we should be hearing on the, we should be conducting a hearing on the merits either today or later on. And I think also that I read it here that there was a, there was supposed to be a subpoena for discovery by the complainant. And 
it was called up because it was uh, it was it was determined that Mr. Watimo would, would take the Fifth Amendment. Well, he probably should take the Fifth Amendment. I mean, our, any finding we make in this matter is potentially prejudicial as in the, in the federal case. You know, uh, what do you think so or not? I, I mean, I, uh, uh, Mr. Patino uh, uh, needs to be at his committee. Uh, I don't know how we're going to resurrect them subject to discovery, but there's not going to be any. The only way we're going to find out what really happened in terms of these, uh, these uh, uh, when, when there were no disclosures here, uh, adequate disclosures, is through the discovery process. So we're not going to get discovery. So I don't know what we're doing here with this. I, I think we should just uh, 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 stop this right now and, and wait until the federal uh, uh, case or investigation or, or, or is, uh, is resolved. And if there's no charge on the federal level, then we can move ahead. If there is a charge, then we're, I, I think we should stop right, right here and now. So that's just my, my take on this. And I'm going to hold it all in any motion. Yes, Mr. Chair, Mr. Jacobs. The, um, the board's order of May of 16, which is the monthly meeting one year ago, um, directed the committee to file amended reports, and no amended reports have been filed. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. I, I seem to recall either you or another attorney for the committee appearing before us at that meeting, or perhaps a meeting that followed, representing to us that if we gave a little time, the amended reports would be forthcoming. I haven't reviewed the transcript from those meetings to remember exactly who said what, but that's my recollection. Is that accurate? Um, I don't believe so. You don't think we were? It was suggested to us by by the committee's counsel that amended reports would be forthcoming. No, I believe what had happened in the May 18th hearing, which I was in attendance at, that uh, more time was given for the consideration of amending the reports. And at that time, the board issued an order and subsequent to that, uh, once the board found that that order wasn't complied with, it ordered a public hearing. But I, I assure you, Mr. Carruthers, that uh, during the hearing process, which I think was conducted fairly, uh, subpoenas were delivered by complainant's attorney to the committee, and we had responded fully to those subpoenas for information. So we have cooperated through this entire process and wanted to make sure that the process is conducted fairly. Okay, I'm looking at the uh, minutes from our meeting of May of 16, and it was actually you. Mr. Jacob. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is Tony Jacob, attorney with Henshaw and Colbert's on behalf of the respondent. I would only say that the committee has been dissolved in December of 2015 and that we will amend the reports. I'd like to see the 60 days run from today. I think that's standard course of procedure for this body. And then I'd also like to clarify that 9-7 of the Campaign Finance Act states that the Treasury is to keep records for two years. So we, we plan to go back two years and amend the reports. That's what you said a year ago. It's been a year. We haven't received any reports. And it sounds like today your position is that, well, we were never going to amend the reports. And the reason we never amended the reports is because the committee is dissolved and who's going to sign it. And I, I think that's what I heard you just say. So that's it sounds correct, Mr. Brothers. OK. I so, said that at the time in May, the way I recall the meeting mm -hmm. and the way I recall the subsequent meetings is that we were considering amending and trying to find a way to amend the reports. Okay. We were trying to find a way to amend the reports. So and we were not able to. And the reason, as you stated here today, is because there's no one to sign it. You want to re you want to restate that for me? Sure. There's there's three points. One is that we've delivered all the documentation. And if you look at what's been put in the record of the public hearing, there was correspondence from the board many years ago, from the board staff many years ago, directing the committee to take certain action with respect to its reports, giving advice on how to report the, the information, whether it be happies or, or other information. And we, uh, as the committee, uh, attempted to comply many years ago with those orders, with the advice and guidance of, of the board staff. During the hearing process, we 
complied with and turned over all documents. The committee has been dissolved for over a year. There's nobody that can sign any sort of amended report at testation. And in addition to that, my, the other point that I mentioned was that the chairperson, the former chairperson, who's no longer a candidate or can be a candidate for office, is restricted from being involved in any campaign activity per state statute. So it's fair to say that even if we gave you more time, no amended reports would be forthcoming for the reasons you just specified. That's correct. And but you're, Mr. Carruthers, what I, what I would like to also respond to is that the board, that this committee, is not willfully violating the board's order. It just, it cannot. There is, there has been information presented to the board, put into the public record, um, that, that this committee cannot take action. It is not willful. It just, it just cannot take the action. It is not capable of doing so. Well, Mr. Jacob, where I think that that rings a little hollow is that you're here. You've been obviously directed by someone to state that, that the uh, reports can't be amended. You've represented that the material to amend those reports is available and has been circulated as part of the hearing process. But there's, but they just haven't been assembled and and uh, digested in a manner to make the amendment possible. And then there's no one there to sign it. There, there, there is. There are people involved in this process that are perfectly capable of of doing that. Um, and I think not only was the the uh, my belief is not only was the board order willfully violated, but the comments that. Uh, that Mr. Carruthers referenced in his discussion with you on this, suggests that the willful nature of the violation extends well prior to the actual hearing date. So it's, it's frustrating to hear you take that position now, um, given the representations that were made to the board in May of 2016, and extensions of time were granted based on those representations. Mr. Mr. Jacobs, on top of that, just baffles me as to how the committee can't do this and it can't do that and it can't do this. How can it hire a world-class attorney myself? Thank you, Mr. Keith. I agree with that comment. Um, with regard to the committee, it's a dissolved committee. And if you think of what dissolved committees have, they have records, they have stuff, and we are the custodian of that stuff. And during the hearing process, as the custodian of the, of the documents for the dissolved committee, we were able to <coughs> turn that information over. It's still dissolved. And, and it doesn't have somebody to, to step in place to sign attestation on behalf of the committee. Mr. Cadigan, I, I'd just also like to mention, with respect to your point, is that there is still this investigation going on. I understand that, all, all, which is all the more puzzling to me why he would have engaged in all this rather than said a year ago, we're not going to, we, we can't comply with any order that the board renders uh, compelling us to, to amend the reports. Because here we are, we've, we've expended all these time, resources, and energy. And it was, Frank, I again recall a, com a comment you made about having to spare the expense of of a hearing officer, and those expenses are considerable. Um, so, yeah, I, I, in, in light of uh, the federal investigation, I, I'm puzzled why we've engaged in everything we've done for the last year, but um, I guess it's in the interest of due process that, that all the, the committees that come before us are entitled to, but again, it's, it's um, a source of frustration to me as we sit here today. I'm puzzled, though. Well, in Mr. In Mr. Kennedy, we did ask that this board stay all proceedings, and they decided not to. So, so there were right, but that, 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 that issue was taken up. We, you know, just for the record, for, for the people here in Chicago, we denied that. That was argued before the appellate court. The appellate court sided with us, and the attorney general argued that on behalf of this agency. And I, so, I, I, it was an important point to make that we don't stay our proceedings. For these. It was the act. What has happened isn't the result of anything the board has done, which is frankly, I believe, 
bent over backwards to be fair under these circumstances. It's, it's the actions that have been taken uh, in response to the complaint. Um, but, uh, Yes, uh, Mr. Jacobs, speaking of dissolved uh, committees, I don't know if it's part of uh, Member Carruthers' transcript from the May meeting or just when, but I do recall you instructing this board that we lost total jurisdiction when the committee closed, correct? Uh, that was an argument that we made in um, during the closed uh, preliminary hearing, yes. I, and I think you made an open session because I remember we, I think during open session, we probably uh, discussed some of the points that were discussed in the closed hearing. That, that, that we had no jurisdiction going forward, correct? Yes. Thank you. Yes, Member Carroll. So it, that one of the positions you've taken here today is for your reasons of not complying with the board's order, um, because it's not possible, is, is the fact that the committee is dissolved and there's no one to sign the reports. That's what you said. Now, with that logic, then we wouldn't have jurisdiction to pursue any committee as soon as it dissolves. Is that fair to say? Uh, jurisdiction that I think is set forth by statute is that what you have the ability to do is if the committee were to ever reopen or the candidate were to ever open another committee, that there would be a restriction of their ability to be placed on the ballot. Under that argument, anyone who's is in a little trouble with us, all they have to do is dissolve the committee, and then we can't pursue it. I, I just I find that argument is uncompelling and contrary to the election code. Well, Mr. Mantel, what's the history and precedent in this? Matter as far as uh, board action, we've dealt with closed yeah. committees before. Yeah. It, it, it's not unusual for us to have a matter against the committee that's been filed out. And, and the idea is that we're looking to get records and reporting corrected for that period of time that they were in existence. Once they final out for the period of time after they're final, they don't have to do reporting to us. But up until the point in time where they final out, they have an obligation to us to accurately report their, their expenditures and receipts and the like. And we've always taken the position and, and operated, I think, for the entire time we've had campaign disclosure, that once you final out, we can still go after you for the reporting that you did up to that point. Thank you. Other questions? We have dealt with the motion to stay, I believe it was last fall. I voted for it as member of the government, I understand, referring to the federal authorities, but the uh, motion wasn't granted and proceedings were before us today and the order was issued and it's not been complied with. Actually, several orders. Quite a bit of a on that. You know, because uh, it's a uh, uh, federal case. Uh, the, the, you know, we, we can uh, we can vote uh, that they fail to comply with the board order and the initial refinement. But uh, the other, as I said before, the only way we're going to get to the bottom of this, and I think the third disclosure problem is through discovery. It's a pain. And we're not going to get there. And while the federal matter is still pending, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what the appellate court said that they uh, the issue a statement as to you know why they uh, they, they upheld uh, or denial of the motion to stay. Uh, I think they made some statement that they probably uh, don't want to deal with it because of the federal matters. Uh, you know, I, I, I think we're, we're, we're we should not. I don't think at this point we can go get here and on the merits. I really don't. And, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, I voted for the motion to stay. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to vote against the, uh, the, the follow-up motion that we're going to vote on today. Uh, uh, I just think it shouldn't be here. But Mr. Jacob, you said you didn't comply with the discovery during the uh, public hearing process. Uh, we did. We did comply. Well, I was 
discovery, but not amend the report. I, that was that the point I was trying to make, Mr. Chairman. Um, Kim, what do you think of uh, point uh, of our, our three point recommendation from the hearing officer, the second one, where it talks about um, that we should find that the committee did not willfully violate our order regarding the disclosing whether or not the committee had any owned or leased any vehicles um, because it was, and as per Mr. Cook's attorney, because we learned about that from his deposition rather than through some voluntary disclosure made by the committee. Well, not even voluntary, it was ordered to be disclosed. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, I think that the, I tend to feel that the hearing officer had a good point on that particular one. They were told to amend and in their amendments to identify uh, lease or own vehicles. Uh, they didn't have lease or own vehicles, so amending would have been somewhat futile if there weren't any vehicles to identify in the amended report. Yes, to that specific point. Can I just uh, lease or own vehicles? I, I disagree with that. The, the, the reports that are filed with the board are the mechanism that we use. It, it isn't whether or not it satisfies us or some hearing officer. The essence of this is how do we notify the public? And it's those reports and the, and the media uh, and watchdog groups. It's those reports that are the mechanism for doing that. And, and uh, so I think that the hearing officer on that uh, issue missed the point. Uh, and, and miss the spirit of, of the campaign finance disclosure laws, which is to inform the public and press and watchdog groups. And that wasn't done. But that's sort of said, well, it's insider game of baseball here. We all know now, because it was in the deposition, but no one would read that deposition except maybe the 15 people that have read it. I, I, I'm not on that point, Cassandra, just on that point. Standard, I think, that we hold all committee to, all committees to provide is full disclosure and compliance with the campaign disclosure laws of Illinois, and for them to comply with us when we seek further information. That's the standard we hold all committees to. And it's, and it's what we specifically ordered at this committee a year ago. More of a statement than a question. Other questions or statements? Anyone else wish to be heard? Mr. Chairman, uh, question we I, I think with respect to point number two, that the hearing officer did his best <coughs> to give the committee the benefit of the doubt. He had no he had no amended reports. So he went with the information gleaned from the, uh, the, the hearing. He heard the testimony that they did not lease their own any vehicles. As I say, I, I think he, there's a bit of a stretch, but he did the best he could in giving the committee the benefit of the doubt. But, but I agree with Member Caddy. Those reports are, are, the, are the, the basis for, for this information, i.e., for the public to know, and there are none. And, and if you look at the narrow ruling, the May 18th order amend, ordered amended reports, they were not submitted, period. You went to the public hearing, certain information was provided, the hearing officer gave the <coughs> benefit of the doubt as to point number two. Um, I, I, I don't feel one way or the other with respect to that point, but cer certainly number three was in order. Well, I, well and, uh, something else on point number two, you know, it was ignoring the fact that this information only came, came, came up through the deposition conducted by the complainant's counsel. Um, you know, it was the, 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 the witness was the former committee treasurer, and if we go to Mr. Jacobs' position, um, that the committee has no officers, can't file reports, then it's, I, I question whether this committee treasurer is volunteering this information in deposition on behalf of the committee. If we were to follow Mr. Jacobs' argument that this person no longer acts in that capacity. So I, I, I'm a little reluctant to give the committee credit for disclosing this information when it only did so at the request or through a deposition by the complainant's counsel and through and by a person, a witness, who I think the, who the respondent's counsel has suggested at least is not acting as an officer of the committee at this time because nobody is. And another another point related can to I respond that, to that, Mr. Yeah, Chairman? Can I, can, 
one more point in that I had to um, Some of the material was submitted and then placed by the uh, hearing officer subject to a protective order. Is that correct? Can either counsel speak to that? It, is, it was subject to a protective order. What's the status of that protective order right now? Because I'm sorry, who speaks? Uh, it was subject to a protective order. Uh, any of that of those documents that were submitted as evidence into at the public hearing is not now subject to a protective order. The hearing officer made that ruling. That's right. Okay. Mr. Jacobs, you want to respond? Uh, I, yes. Uh, when Ms. Panu conducted her deposition, she did it under oath and she made truthful statements. If this board wants to disregard truthful statements made under oath with regard to what should or shouldn't be reported, I think that it is uh, serving disjustice to the public because the information that was submitted by Ms. Monu was truthful and accurate, uh, as she had stated. Uh, during the hearing process and during discovery, both complainant's attorney and respondent's attorney agreed to rely upon that deposition. And so for, for now saying that that deposition shouldn't be relied upon, I think it goes against what the public hearing was about. And that was to try to uh, cooperate and, and turn information over and, and try to get as much uh, truthful information as possible through that process. No one's suggesting that we disregard the deposition. Right. What I'm suggesting is I'm not inclined to give your committee credit for the, for the, for the disclosure that was made when it was only done so by subpoena, subpoena deposition, and by an officer who you report no longer acts on behalf of this committee. So I'm not trying to disregard that. We learned some pretty valuable things from this former committee treasurer in the deposition, including the current location of the former records that were in their possession. However, so I'm not suggesting we disregard anything. I'm just saying I'm not inclined to give your committee any brownie points to this disclosure that was done, I think, anything other than willfully. Uh, Mr. Carruthers, you missed, I think, one point that I mentioned, and that's that during the hearing process, complainant's attorney, respondent's attorney, agreed to rely upon that deposition and not take any further action with regard to her statements. Decided not to bring her in to testify during the public hearing or take any other action because we were relying upon that information. Other questions for counsel or our general counsel or Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Governor. You know, the, uh, the only way we're going to be able to clarify and find out why these expenditures uh, were handled this way and uh, you know the reason they were handled they, they were they were handled this way uh, in terms of the, the, the gas station and the bank uh, and. Uh, uh, this is from Mr. Mateo himself. You know, uh, he's the head of the committee. He's the, he's, the, he's, the, he's the public official. He's the one that has to testify and tell us why he, he did what he did in, ter in terms of uh, his, uh, the, the, the committee spending. And uh, there's a lot of money involved here. But he's not going to do this. I think the Fifth Amendment to protect himself in the, in the federal case. And that's why I think we're spinning our wheels. You know, uh, uh, until they, the federal investigation is completed, and uh, 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 either Mr. Montino is charged or not, not charged, and if he's charged, until the uh, the, the federal case is uh, been disposed. So, but, but again, I'm being repetitious. I'm sorry. And I'm just, from my position, I just, I, I think we separate the two. I think the federal investigation continues, or it doesn't. To us, it's not even been confirmed that. It, that it exists. We're concerned about violations of the Illinois Election Code. I suspect they, if this investigation is ongoing, are concerned about violations of federal law. Um, and, you know, it's the same reason I voted against the stay last year. It's, I, I think what we're doing is independent of that. We're concerned about different things. If we don't look into violations of the Election Code, I'm not sure who else will. I, and, but I agree with you. And we're never going to get to the bottom of this because the one person who can provide us with this information has indicated he's not going to, despite having every opportunity over the past almost year and a half to come before us or before uh, uh, the, the public hearing 
or our hearing officer or any meeting we've had to clear up what I'm sure we all initially hoped was it's a big misunderstanding and another another case of a committee that just needs to file amended reports. But instead, what we've heard instead is that it's not going to happen. We're not going to get any inform information from them. And as, as confirmed by the committee's attorney today, even if we were to give them more time to file amended reports, it's not enough forthcoming. So I, I, it's disappointing in that, and I know it's disappointing to the public, disappointing for the media, disappointing for the complainant, that we um, that we're gonna that we will be unable to get to the bottom of this for those reasons. And yeah, I don't I don't feel like we should hold up resolving this matter with our agency here today based upon some federal investigation that has not even been directly confirmed to us by the US Attorney's Office. So at one point on that, in the deposition that the, the treasurer did confirm she received a federal grand jury subpoena. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. And then she was required to bring documents, produce documents to in response to that subpoena, a federal grand jury subpoena. <coughs> okay. So I, I don't want to, you know, I, I, but I just, I, I'm not sure if you were familiar enough with, with that. Yes. Yeah, I, 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 I believe that the federal investigation exists. Um, I just know that we're not necessarily a part of it. But it may have been concluded. We don't know. We don't, we don't know. So I'm reluctant to hold the whole action based upon something that we're not really divided on. So yeah, it's certainly, it certainly is going on. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, the federal investigation is evidently based on the same facts that we're dealing with, okay? And, and uh, I don't know if it's a tax case or, 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 or what it is. I, I really like to know what the federal investigation is all about. But we're dealing with the, the facts we're dealing with are, are evidently the same facts that the feds are dealing with. And, and uh, again, uh, 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 Mr. Rapino isn't going to come in until that case is, is disposed of. Uh, he's not going to come in here and go on the record. And any finding we make is. Uh, uh, you know, there, there needs a violation of the of the of the, uh, of the uh, uh, campaign finance act and, and uh, all the evidence that we bring forth uh, that, that show that uh, it could potentially potentially be prejudicial if, if there is a federal criminal case. So that's all I'm saying. I, I, I said we're not going to find anything out. The, you know, we're not going to find anything. Of any details about how these expenditures uh, were handled and the reason for it, and, and whether or not the, 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 these uh, expenditure uh, expenditures, the way the way they were done, constitutes a violation. That, that's what the hearing has to bring out. And we're, we're not at a public hearing stage. We're only here at uh, 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 like an interlocutory stage to, to decide whether or not. Uh, 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 Mr. Latino violated a court order. Well, maybe he did. Not a court order, but a board order. But maybe he did. But, you know, the, the case shouldn't be here to begin with. So I, I do agree with you, disagree with you, Andy. I, I think uh, we don't know what the federal case is about, but let's find out. Well, I, uh, well, I, you know, I voted with you on the motion to stay, but that's been litigated. We know we got an order. That was issued. We know it hasn't been complied with and, and won't be, and we know why. But I, I don't know how we can ignore it. Did you wish to be heard, Mr. King? No, I, Mr. Governor Guthrie clarified what I want to clarify. We're not finding that the committee did or did not violate the election code if we adopt the recommendation hearing officer. We're finding that they failed to comply with the board. I know that that's the issue. I know where to go. I, I, I know, but I, I don't think, I think we right. black holes that we stay the proceedings until the federal case is resolved. Go ahead. I'm right. making a motion this time. I, I, know, I know where it's going, but I'm going to make the motion anyway. Is there a motion? All right. There's a motion. No second. Motion. motion was made to stay this proceedings, which is, I think, we've had that motion. Well, the federal case is resolved one way or the other. Responded, but it was seconded by Member Watson. Uh, discussion on that. Anyone mm -hmm. wish to be heard? If not, roll call, please. Mr. Cadigan? No. Mr. Brothers? No. Ms. Hopper? No. Mr. Keith? No. Mr. Rapich? Mr. Rapich? 
And number three, the respondent committee willfully violated the court's May 18, 2016 order vis-a-vis -vis failing to amend the disclosure reports filed in 2014 and 2015 to A, reflect an accurate breakdown between gas and repair made to happy super service, to identifying the actual recipients of each itemized expenditure uh, made to kind of the abbreviated HSS. Uh, of the Spring Valley Bank, if I remember correctly, the uh, at the bank. Uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, identifying the actual recipient of each itemized expense, expenditure made to HHS, which would have been Happy Super Service, as well as three, identifying the specific purpose of any expenditures made to SVCB, which would be Spring Valley Community Bank. And then he recommends that the board specify consistent with the statutory and uh, administrative code rules. Yeah. All right, Madam President, I move that we adopt the recommendation of the hearing officer as to items number one and three, but not two, and post a fine of $5,000 for willfully violating the board's order as included and recommended by the hearing officer as to number three. Second. All right. Next question. What do you want to do with number two? I don't agree with it. I, I, I just, I am very reluctant to give him credit for, I'm, I'm very reluctant to move that the, they, that they did not willfully violate or order to disclose information that they did not willfully disclose. So you want to include in your motion that you find they did not? Sure. And that we, and but that we find the committee did willfully violate the board's order in May 2016 regarding disclosure of information relating to any committee only for this year. Second, that motion is modified. I'd rather have a motion that as to the hearing officer's recommendation as. It was the one has initially You want to separate it out? Yeah. yeah. To take it in because steps? I like, you know, I disagree. Or, uh, take it in steps. Take, take it in steps. Okay. Yeah. In that case, I'll modify my motion and again adopt the recommendation of the hearing. Officer, as to numbers one and three, and find that as to number three, the committee willfully violated the board's order of May 18th, 2016. And of course, I'll find Right, motion made and second. Some cases. But, but the recommendation on number one was it's not willfully violated. Correct. You're okay right. with that. Okay. I didn't know how to say it. No, and, 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 and the motion was, was Mr. Jacobs well said that they only had two years worth of records right. at the okay. time. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. All right, does everybody understand what the motion was? Mm -hmm. Concur with the recommendation of the hearing officer and general counsel as to points one and two. We'll vote up, or one and three rather. We'll vote on two later. Anybody else wish to be heard? Did you wish to be heard first? Uh, well, yeah, can I just make a not a brief statement um, based on all those things that have gone on before? So, when this issue first came up, it was reported in the media. It was reported that this board had no authority to take on this issue. By itself. And so without some member of the public coming forward and and complaining about this issue, this board had no jurisdiction. My client David Cook did that over a year in March of 2016. He brought a complaint. The complaint alleged that the committee mishandled or misreported funding or expenditures to Abbey's and to the bank. That complaint has not yet been ruled on over a year later. If this board expects citizens to come forth and make complaints when there are issues of uh, questionable expenditures made by campaign committees, then it can't continue to push the issue down the road. The issue in the complaint was whether the committee violated the election code, and even if the board 
follows the recommendations of the hearing of the examiner, it still won't issue, it still won't deal with the substantive issue, meaning that the complainant's complaint actually won't be heard. Some of have said that we don't have enough discovery information because Frank Martino pled the fifth. But that's not true. We have the deposition testimony and we have documents, and that shows that with respect to the happiest expenditures, that what the committee was doing was paying happies for tanks of gas to people's personal vehicles. That's not allowed by the code, and that's consistent with, it. they consistently did that. In addition to that, in 1999, we're not here to hear, yeah, yeah. you're asking us to take action that's not before the board today. You know, the board has been this a very long road. We can't, you know, we issued an order, and we gave a good faith opportunity for compliance. Now we're going to deal with the fact that that order wasn't complied with. You can't ask us to deal with something that's not before us legally today. This is not an issue. I think I've given I, I, plenty of opportunity to be heard today on what's before this board. My point, Mr. Chairman, well, is I, that I think we all got your point. Mr. Mr. Cook can't be expected to hire a lawyer and continue to litigate this case for two years just to show something that is already before this board. The, the parties have already made arguments, testimony, and shown evidence at the last public hearing. All that information is in the briefs that the party wrote. If this board doesn't take action on that, that means that we have to have another public hearing and then another hearing examiner take, make a recommendation, and then another board meeting. This is, this is just I a think we're we're Can I think we're going to address this, Mr. Schwab, in a way that maybe you'll find a little more complicated. But our role is one of disclosure. There are other participants in the administration of election laws, the prosecution of criminal violations of election laws that, that may be looking at this. The, the Attorney General has jurisdiction to do that. The local state's attorney in LaSalle County. Um, I, I think what your client has done in this case has been heroic. But the disclosure laws prescribe a role for us here. They prescribe generally a role, the complaint process gives your client the ability to come in and bring this to the public's attention. I think at some point, the very near future, he should be standing in a room full of people accepting an award for the work that's been done. Uh, it, it has cited some real peculiar irregularities, to, to say the least, about this case. But when Mr. Martino decided that he was going to essentially plead the Fifth Amendment with respect to us and our limited ability to pursue criminal sanctions, that effectively it, it, it goes into the, the role of state criminal prosecutors. If, if what you have now is compelling, as you say, I would encourage you to do that. You have the ability to do that. And, uh, but and it's, a frust it's a frustration to me in this role that we run into these limitations. But Mr. Martino has exercised that right, um, and that is frustrating and disappointing. I wish he would have done it a long time ago. We could have saved your client and all of us a lot of time and, and energy in <coughs> dancing around uh, all of this material. So that's, uh, again, I hope that's yeah. maybe of some Just comfort to you. Of some comfort uh, to you, but maybe not. I, I second everything you said about about your client, Mr. Cook, and about what this about about what this is done. Because frankly, had he not come forward with this, we all may not know. Okay. And right you may be about everything you said, but as I think Mr. Chairman was getting ready to uh, comment, I thought I heard him say is, as a member of the bar, I'm sure you understand what our role really is in this, and that when the issues are presented to whether it's a court of law or whether it's a board like this, we're limited to those issues. And it's with, but, but what makes it all the more frustrating is, you know, and I said it earlier, I'll say it again, the one person who can resolve all of this and to provide the documents that you've been seeking to get the answers to the question your clients have been at, that your client has been asking, the one person who has that information, as confirmed by his former committee treasurer, who said that he, she gave all the documents to him. He has the ability to do it, and yet he's, he has indicated, I'm not going to give you anything. He's indicated he's going to take the Fifth Amendment. So even if we have the power to do as you suggest, how are we going to get it from him? 
So the appropriate place for the continuation of this is, as Member Cadigan suggested, is with the prosecutors who may ignore, who have the ability to ignore his Fifth Amendment privilege. And, I mean, while they won't get anything out of him, they have investigative powers that we do not have to, in the absence of information, pursue it further, which is something we don't have the ability to the ability to do. I hope you and client appreciate that, what our, what our role is and what it is in here. Okay, can I address Please. that issue? Please. Mr. Chairman? Yeah. Hang on. I may have spoken. Go ahead, Member McGuffish. Yeah, uh, well, from, first of all, uh, uh, for the reasons I stated earlier, uh, uh, Mr. Latino was entitled to take the Fifth Amendment when there's a federal case pending, criminal case pending. Uh, second of all, I move the previous question. Yeah, we can add argument. I'd like to address a specific point that the uh, members have made about the Fifth Amendment rights. Then I'll to respond. Go ahead, briefly. Mr. Martino has the right to, uh, to uh, take the Fifth Amendment any time he wants, for any reason, to anybody, including federal prosecutors, including, uh, including uh, state prosecutors. This board is not relying on any testimony of Frank Martino. The evidence is before you in our briefs. There are documents, hundreds and hundreds of pages of documents. There's testimony from Patricia Manu who handled all of these expenditures. Mr. Chairman, I moved the previous question. Oh, you have this is not a hearing on the merits. Uh, apparently, you don't understand that the issue before this court or this board is whether or not our order was compliant. I do understand. We, no, I'm sorry. Mr. Swab, you know, this, this agency works very hard to administer the election code. We follow the statute. It became apparent that we needed an issue in order to comply. Uh, it's now apparent that that order has not been complied with, and there's a motion that's going to dispose of that and take what action we're lawfully required to do. I'm not going to have you litigate the rest of it when that's not before this board today. So, uh, Mr. Jake, do you wish to respond at all? No, thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, well, if not, you know, the first has been called. So we have a first, a motion and a second. Yes. Pending. And this is as to the hearing officer's recommendation in points one and three. Does and everybody the, understand what we're voting on? The imposition of the $5,000 fine. Right. With the uh, committee indicating that there's an intention to file supplemental reports. Amy, could you go a little, please? Mr. Cadigan? Yes. Mr. Brothers? Yes. Ms. Hopper? Yes. Mr. Keith? Aye. Mr. McGuffish? No. Ms. Watson? No. Vice Chairman Allen? Yes. Chairman Schultz? Yes. So as to one and three, we'll find not willful on the first and willful on the third and impose the $5,000 fine, which is our maximum. Is there a motion then as to the... Uh, sure. Second recommendation. I move that we, that we uh, do not adopt the recommendation of the hearing officer as to number two, and that we instead find that the committee willfully violated the board's order of May 18th, 2016, by failing, um, willfully failing, to provide information regarding whether the committee owned or leased any vehicles. All right. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Discussion on that? That would uh, go against the hearing officer's recommendation that it was not well. Um, I have a question to sponsor. Do you wish to impose a fine? Impose a fine or anything or just make the fine? Do we have to, do we have to Mr. Menzel, do something besides just making the fine? I was thinking that as you've already imposed the fine based upon the first motion, you were clearing the record as to the finding. That was my intention. Yes. So, you, so you're, you're... It was the same order. You're cruising, as you will, on the fine you've already imposed. Yes, it was the same order. Uh, it, since it all stemmed from the same order, I assume there would be one fine, but yes. Um, I'm just clarifying. So we would, we would impose the fine, but it's concurrent rather than consecutive funds. Oh, yeah, no secondary funds. No second funds. No second funds. Afraid that so, so in other words, if, if number three were thrown out for any reason, where we'd still have the final correct two. 
to impose the same five thousand dollar fine for your All right. Second. Motion made. Second. Roll call, please. Mr. Haggard? Yes. Mr. Brother? Yes. Ms. Hoffer? Yes. Mr. Keith? Aye. Ms. Ordefich? No. Ms. Watson? No. Vice Chairman Gowan? Yes. Chairman Schultz? No. <coughs> that recommendation was, in, was not adopted, and a uh, member for others' motion uh, is approved. I, uh, I would like to go a step further, and, I, and I, maybe you all want to vote for this, maybe not, but I am certainly sympathetic to the statements made by the complaint and its counsel today um, regarding uh, getting to the bottom of this matter. With the votes that we just took, our, our role in this has been somewhat concluded, um, but it needs to go somewhere. Therefore, and, as, and we have done this in the past. Um, I would move that we copy our file and refer it to the Office of the Illinois Attorney General, the South County State's Attorney's Office, for potential criminal prosecution of violations of the Illinois Election Code as they may deem appropriate. Second. All right. Motion made and second. Is there discussion on that? They, within their prosecutorial discretion, would wish to make if the board feels it's appropriate. The board has that ability to do. And once we've entered a final sure. order, we then we've been we, we, We've concluded our right. matter with the prior two motions. This would be a handoff to them to determine whether there were, for example, I'm not saying necessarily there are, but for example, some sort of a criminal violation that is within the realm of state's attorneys or attorney generals to prosecute and is not within our realm to handle. And, and if the committee chose to file any amended reports, if we made that referral, if the committee chose to file any amended reports, we could then also make a referral of that knowledge to the same people. I, I, I would assume that the attorney sure. providing information to those entities with the entire record that we would be well, but I mean, after we turned it over, they filed amended reports. So we would supplement what we had given to the AP or the uh, state's attorney's office. Member McGuffin. Yeah. How can we refer anything out of the, the attorney general? Uh, not there's been determined. There's, there's been no uh, uh, finding of a violation, number one, because we haven't conducted a public hearing <clears throat> on, on the merit. Uh, there's, there's, Right now, the viola violations are alleged. What, if, what is there to turn over to the attorney general? And if we, you know, we, we have to determine that there may be a criminal violation here, but we have to find a violation in the first place, and that hasn't been done. But there's nothing to turn over to the attorney general. Well, I think that's a good point. The only thing we found <coughs> is that the court order wasn't complied with. Right. And well, as we, a former, we find the we find the respondent five thousand dollars. We voted against it. Uh, so the, so there has been a violation of a board, but there is a violation of a board order. We've already uh, taken care of that. What's there to turn over to the attorney general? Well, in, in the past, we've, we've made criminal referrals without making an actual finding on the merits. Is that correct, Mr. Menzel? We haven't made a finding. We have, for example, in ballot access matters where we see suspicious uh, patterns within uh, petitions, turn things over to the state attorney's <coughs> office for whatever further uh, action they deem to be appropriate. So there's precedent for this whole agency. We have a public hearing coming to determine that. There's precedent for it. It's what we can do. And to the extent that it might possibly interfere with what the federal government is doing, they can work that out between them. I, just, I feel like our role in this is included with the prior votes, and this is the one thing that we can do to pass it off. And if, it, and if these agencies decide not to take it up, or if they determine that there's not enough to take anything further, then that's, that's on them. But for our part, we, we have such suspicions as it, and through the allegations that have been made. And I think that it is certainly within our, it, there's certainly precedents within our discretion to pass it along, come what may. 
So we're also aware that there's a pending federal investigation. We're also aware there's a pending federal investigation, and typically state prosecutors defer to the feds as been as state uh, member key. Since I'm not a licensed attorney, can somebody tell me what state? What's code? I can't hear you, Member Keith. Can someone tell me which section of the code you're talking about for the referral authority? Requires that no, I want to no, I want to read it myself, Mr. Cook. Well, there's a couple. I want somebody to tell me the section number so I can read it myself, please. Not because we don't want 
whatever actions it takes. We know the federal investigation is going to be out of the leverage. We're supposed to make a record. I'm sorry, Mr. Keith. I believe on four fours we're supposed to make a record. Generally, but a motion to refer is not necessarily a motion to refer. Right. Really, part of the disclosure case that would be something that would be reviewable on administrative review. Thank you. Do you wish to make any recommendations? If the court wants to tell me to, I will later. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Schraub. Thank you, Mr. Jacob. We'll move on to the complaint about our campaign disclosure item. Our item 16 is the action item. Might be. All right. Thank you. Are there comments from the general public? Either in Chicago or here in Springfield? Sir, do you wish to be heard? Yes, sir. My name is Kirk Allen. All right. I'm co-founder of Edgar County Watchdogs. In regards to the Frank Montino case, I understand you've already made a ruling. I'll get into some of those comments that I really would have enjoyed to present before you make your decision. But I'd first like to address your public comment policy. Under item D, only one person may speak to a given topic unless the chair allows additional speakers. I would contend that that violates constitutional rights of individuals. If I want to speak about Frank Montino and another person wanted to speak about it, that would be a violation of your rules. So I would hope that we could amend that to address that issue. I've been on the board, sir, for six years. I don't ever recall anyone not being allowed to address us. All the more reason to amend the policy. Because some people may look at that and say, well, only one of us can speak, and then they don't even go. People will look at those agenda items and see something like that, and they avoid going to a meeting. One thing we do enforce, though, is the time limit. Not a problem. Be concise. Please, no interruptions, then. Thank you, sir. In regards to findings, findings of evidence, one of the things we heard during the Frank Montino case was there was no finding. I would argue, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm sure there's plenty of them in here. In regards to the pleadings, the most recent pleading, did members of this board read those last case of pleadings that were provided by the attorneys? This is your time to make a statement that we're not going to have a dialogue. Just go ahead. I'm not asking for a dialogue. If there's any consensus of simply yes or no, I understand you don't have to answer the question. I have the floor. Thank you, sir. The question before this public body, complaint argues that the committee reported these expenditures incorrectly. That was the goal of that whole process. In Mr. Montino's pleading, this may be true to some of the reported expenditures, and they go on to give an excuse. In their recent pleading, they admitted that those expenditures were improperly reported. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Chairman? Where was this gentleman when the Montino case was heard earlier? I was sitting back there waiting for my public comment. He's present. That was a repertory to speak while the case was being heard. I can't interrupt a public body like that except during a public comment. Well, you know, this isn't the time to start litigating the Montino case. Are you stopping his five-minute speaking time while this other guy is talking? Can you tell me how much time I have, sir? Go ahead. Thank you. I didn't bring it up earlier because it wasn't my time to. I was respectful of the process. You can comment on it. Obviously, it's already been. In regards to forwarding things, I'll let this public body know. I know you chose and voted not to carry this forward to the Attorney General. I understand that. I would contend it needs to be filed as a criminal complaint with the state police. It has to be an investigative public body. We will be filing that complaint. Their findings will then have to go forward to the appropriate agencies. In regards to parallel issues, I understand the U.S. Attorney's Office was involved. They're looking at federal matters, which are not election matters before this public body. In that regard, for those that are familiar with the Governor Quinn $50 million anti-violence case, in those proceedings before the General Assembly, the U.S. Attorney stepped in and said, stop, please don't move forward anymore because your questioning may interfere. If the U.S. Attorney has an issue with investigations, they'll let you know right away. They run parallel investigations all the time. The most important reason that the public needs this to move forward in a criminal investigation is under state law, we can have access to those records when that investigation is done. 
When they conclude it, no matter what their findings, we can read them. We can't do that in the federal authorities. This public body, in my opinion, failed to make a simple ruling when the very pleadings before them acknowledged they violated the reporting requirements of the law. And that's a big disappointment because Mr. Cook and all of the work we did to put this together in the very first place was for naught. Um, I, it's just really disappointing to see that. Please, last point that I really wish it would have been a question that came up. It was argued that the custodian of the stuff was the law firm. I would love to know how they became the custodian of the stuff. That question was never addressed by anybody because they're answering on behalf of the committee that they say they have custodian of those records, but nobody ever even raised the issue of how that came to be. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Is there anybody else that wishes to... Uh...